Hey, what's up, Zoo Town? Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you're watching this and whenever you're watching this. What a blessing of uh, social media that we have right now. But thanks for joining us at Zoo Town Church as we continue to walk through this new series that I started uh, on the parables called The Thing Behind the Thing. And um, as I mentioned last week, I'm a movie buff, and, and I believe that film and cinematography and all those things are such good indications of, of life. And, and those stories are important because they hit us somewhere. They hit us deep down in our soul. Uh, they make us think, and we love a good story, and so did Jesus. That's why it says he spoke all things and parables because those stories go way down deep in our soul and those stories do something to our consciousness. Those stories are something that we wrestle with and that is how we grow. And so God knows that stories um, are, are how we, we meet him, how we meet each other, how we look back at our life. And so Jesus came and it says he spoke all things in parables because he wanted us to engage these stories. And one of my favorite movies that came out like 20 years ago was called The Beautiful Mind. And it's a story about a guy named John Nash who um, was really just a, a prodigy. He was a genius when it came to mathematics. He was a genius at putting, you know, mathematical puzzles together. Um, and when you watch that movie th for the first time, you notice that about halfway through, it takes this incredible twist. And, and you realize that even though he was a genius and even though uh, he did go to school and, you know, top of his class, all kinds of things, that he actually suffered from being schizophrenic. And, and you realize that in that movie, a lot of the relationships that he had uh, weren't even real. And he was actually asked to be a part of this government scheme to find uh, secrets from, you know, the Russians and the Soviets and all this. And you realize that he made that up, the whole thing up in his mind. And once you see that, uh, and once you understand that, when you go back and watch it again, you realize that that was kind of a key to understanding the whole movie. And then you start seeing little hints of like, oh my gosh, how did I miss that? Or, uh, you know, little scenes that, they, that you watch again that you see that it was actually a delusion in his mind. And so uh, the point of that is once you see it, you can't not see it. And that's what the thing behind the thing is. And that's why we're diving deeper into these parables is because we want to uh, deepen our relationship with God. But we also know that these parables and, and the teachings of Jesus are filled with mystery. And he wanted it that way. And as I said last week, that this... Uh, the way he communicated in his parables, this really frustrates some people because we want to take these literally and we want to, you know, put them in this nice little neat theological box. But that is missing the whole point of why Jesus spoke this way. Again, these stories matter. It, it matters to our consciousness. It matters to our souls. It matters how we, we view God and how we view our world. And so I gave a challenge last week. Um, and, and this is a challenge I want you guys to continue, not just in this parable series, but all this series, that um, I wanted you to read these parables um, in your, your own way, in your own time, and with, with God, with Jesus. Don't read commentaries. Don't go to certain books. Just read these on your own and have Jesus describe these things to you. And the other challenge I want is I, I want you guys to comment on our Facebook or whatever social media it is, uh, just things that God is speaking to you about, things that you see, these, these mysteries that you see see from the parables uh, that we're going to cover, because it's so important that we move into a season that we deepen our relationship with Jesus, your personal relationship with God. We're all at different spots. We're all at different levels of this journey, um, and, and we're going to kind of be unveiling what discipleship looks like at Zootown Church, but basically how we see this is, is we don't want to be a church where People just come and just hear a pastor or, or whatever, um, give a message, and that's it. We want you to have this relationship with Jesus. And we were laughing this week as a staff because at our church, we're actually going to do the opposite of, of what's kind of gone on in the American church is we are almost kind of devaluing our platform. We're telling you not to follow us. We're telling you to follow Jesus. We're telling you to think for yourself. We're telling you to, to take this moment and this time to have the Holy Spirit speak to you about these things, not just Pastor Scott. Because this is so important that we take the time, that we take, uh, you know, make the effort to, to deepen and grow this relationship with Christ. Because we believe he's speaking to all of you. Even if you are not a believer watching this, or you're not a follower of Christ yet, we aim to convince you that it's worth following. But we believe he's speaking to you right now, wherever you're at. 
And that's what our goal is at Zootown Church, is that we uh, are all kings and priests. We are all priests before God um, in this world. And so that's why, you know, reading these and letting the Holy Spirit just, just speak to you, and not just other men, but the Holy Spirit is so important, and that's the way we want to go as a church. And so last week uh, I read this, but I didn't give you the answer because I wanted you to go research it yourself. But in Luke 8, it says this. It says, when a large crowd was coming together and those from the various cities were journeying, journeying, journeying to him, he spoke by way of parable. The sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell beside the road, and it was trampled underfoot, and the birds of the air ate it up. Other seed fell on rocky soil, and as soon as it grew up, it withered away because it had no moisture. Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up with it and choked it out. Other seed fell into the good soil and grew up and produced a crop a hundred times as great. As he said these things, he would call out, He who has ears, let him hear. His disciples began questioning him as to what this parable meant. And he said, to you it has been granted, and he's speaking to you, to you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. But to the rest it is in, the, in parable, so that seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not understand. Now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. Those beside the road are those who have heard, and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their heart, so that they will not believe and be saved. Those on the rocky soil are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and these have no firm root. They believe for a while, and in time of temptation, fall away. The seed which fell among the thorns, these are the ones who have heard, and as they go on their way, they are choked with worries and riches and pleasures of this life, and bring no fruit to maturity. But the seed in the good soil, these are the ones who have heard the word in an honest and good heart, and hold it fast, and bear fruit with perseverance." Again, we are blessed that this is really the only parable that Jesus goes on to explain. But just because he goes on to explain it, and just because he kind of, it seems like he's just given us this literal meaning, it doesn't mean that that's it. That there is so much depth as you continue to walk with Jesus, as, you're, as you mature in your faith or as you grow, uh, you start seeing so much more even to this simple parable because there really is no simple parable. First, I want you to see one of the things that really matters to this parable and understanding it is that he's talking about a seed, scattering these seeds, and you don't see a seed. This is so important to understand what the mystery is all about and why mystery is so important and why we can't try to box you know, Jesus' message into this systematic theology so we can just put a nice, neat bow on it. We're never done discovering these things. Humanity is continually growing in these parables. And so what that seed buried underground represents is faith. You don't see it. It's something that you're hoping for. It's something that, that yet you know it's there, but you can't see it, but you, you're hoping that it grows. And that is incredibly important to understand as we research and, and, and grow in these parables that he's making a point in this very first parable that he, he tells them is that this is all about faith. And faith is tough. And, in, and sometimes in our, our Western mindset, we really, really struggle with this as well. Because as I say all the time is we always want to gauge success. We always want to see certain things so we know we're on the right path. But then oftentimes we miss the fun and the excitement and the mystery behind these parables and behind following Jesus. Here's one thing that I have seen that I think needs to end when it comes to the church and, and how we perceive the world, is that sometimes we, we think that science is bad, and we always have a, a weird eye on science, but the thing I love about science is if you don't see that mystery is what's constantly fueling science, you don't see that they are actually a part of this parable. Science lives off mystery. Science lives off faith. I know they don't like to say that because, you know, they have to find facts, but the reason we are constantly finding new discoveries and the reason that scientists continue to go out is because there's a mystery to this planet. There's a mystery to things and how they work. And so it's actually this mystery that keeps the sciences going. 
And I actually believe that scientists could be some of the best followers of Jesus and that scientists are some of the best followers of Jesus because they are filled with wonder. They're filled with mystery and they want to continue to seek and seek and seek and find the little things that are buried deep. Scientists can be the greatest followers of Christ because they're just enthralled with mystery. Isaac Newton even says this. He says, as a blind man has no idea of colors, so have we no idea of the manner by which the all-wise God perceives and understands all things. Isaac Newton was this incredible scientist, I mean, renowned by all. But he believed in God, and he just saw that, yes, this mystery of God is what kept him interested in the scientists. I say that because we're reading a passage from Luke, and his real name was Dr. Luke. And Dr. Luke was a guy who um, wasn't claiming to be a follower of Jesus, but he had heard about all the, the crazy stories and all the things that Jesus was doing. And, and as a man of mystery and as a man who, who wanted to find the answers, he actually went out and did the research himself. And so he studied some of these crazy things that Jesus was doing, and he ended up being a companion of Paul, and he ended up writing not only Luke, but the book of Acts. But listen to how Luke even starts his gospel out. He says, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile an account of these things accomplished among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, it seemed fitting for me as well having investigated everything carefully from the beginning to write it out for you in consecutive order, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the exact truth about the things you have been taught. So most people believe that uh, Luke was a private doctor to Theophilus, and that was actually very common back then. Um, and basically, Theophilus had been hearing all these different things, and, and he was a Roman, and he had been hearing about all these different stories that Jesus was doing and, and all these different crazy stuff that was going on. And so Luke went out and investigated all these claims, even these mysterious ones, and he comes back with fact to Theophilus saying, this happened. This is the account of the things that we see. And so what I'm saying, too, is that um, in, in one of these, in, as we look at these passages, like researching and growing and, and longing, it starts with mystery and it starts with faith. That's what the seed is. You don't see it right away. But on the other side of this, I think sometimes we can try to prove things so much that we miss what faith really is. Oftentimes what it does then is it creates divisions among believers, it creates divisions among uh, the family of God, because we end up fighting over facts instead of fighting over faith. And so it's important to see that, yes, this mystery should lead us to want to know more. This mystery of these parables should lead us to continually cultivate and grow. But Jesus starts out by saying, this is about faith. This is about a seed that you see uh, that is put in the ground, but then it's covered up, because that's how something grows. And so this is where faith kicks in. I love how Hebrews says this. It says, And without faith it is impossible to please him. For, th for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. So again, this is what faith actually is. is he says it's impossible to, to please God without faith. I mean, we can have all the facts, we can have all our systematic theologies, we can have all our doctrines, we can have all our mission statements, but he says what really pleases God is faith. So this is why he starts out with this seed in this parable, because you can't see it. So that's what faith is. Faith is, is in this parable. He's saying, look, I am working. No matter what you think, no matter what your background, no matter how much pain you have, no matter what your, your education levels are, God is working all the time, even when you don't see it. Right now in this season of coronavirus, it's so easy to just get inundated with, with news that is, that is negative after negative after negative news. And I'm just, I'm watching people live in so much fear and I'm watching people just like almost be battling it out over the facts that they think they have. But what we need to believe right now is what Jesus says is he is working. That's what a seed does. Even if you don't see it, Right now in this season, God is doing something. He's advancing humanity. He's advancing your life. We just have to believe it in faith. Again, in our Western mindset, we always want to see it to believe it. We've given in to that, the, the worldly model that in order to, to believe it, we have to see it. That's why we're so inundated with stats and, and charts and all kinds of stuff. And I just think that Jesus is saying right here, look, 
God is above all that. And Jesus is working throughout the entire world right now because that's really what this, this passage is about, that it's the whole world that he's scattering this seed out to. So again, this is a, a farming uh, scenario, and I think sometimes we take our, our farming today and take it back then, and, and it is fascinating. It's crazy how much technology has grown even within farming. I was reading this article that they say in the next few years, uh, farmers, all they're going to have to do is basically map out their, uh, their land on GPS, and they're going to have combines that they don't even have to be in. Basically, all night while they're sleeping, the combine is going to be run by a computer and it's going to follow GPS satellites and they can sleep while their land is being farmed. I mean, that's incredible. That's incredible how far humanity has advanced and even farming. But you got to take your mind back to these people. Back then, what did they do? They didn't have irrigation. They didn't have, you know, wheel lines. They had none of that. They planted a seed covered it up, and then had faith that it was going to produce fruit. So Jesus starts this whole thing out by kind of toning us down a peg or two and saying that God is sovereign over all of this, and he's trying to get our minds wrapped around faith, not necessarily facts. So that's important as we walk through this parable. Again, he starts with the Father is working right now. Jesus said that. He says, I am working and my Father is always working. And so that's the thing behind the thing, is that it always sprouts. Whatever God wants to, 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 to come up out of the ground, whatever God wants something in your life, it's going to take fruition. He is going to finish the job. And so, again, this is really important because you got to go back to how their mindset is, is that, that they thought that they were the chosen people, and they thought that they were going to rule the world, and they thought that the Messiah was going to come with sword and destroy anyone that comes against them. And Jesus comes out in this first parable and says, no, the Father scatters this seed throughout the whole world. Not just the elect, not just the chosen not just America, not just the Jews. The Father is spreading out the word of God throughout the entire world. And he is working when you don't see it. He's working in situations that you don't even know about. He's working in people that you would deem uh, as ungodly, that he is just spreading out this seed throughout the entire world. This is why Jesus always said that on earth as it is in heaven, there is no sacred there is no divide between the sacred and the secular. We are the ones who make that divide. It is God saying right here that it's, it's all sacred. He said when he created the world, it is good. That is the whole world. And so it's important that we see that what God is doing is he's, he's saying on earth as it is in heaven, he is working in the entire world and heaven has come here. And that's why we continue to talk about the kingdom of God right here, right now. It's not about getting from here out to there. It's that God has come here. If you look at the Old Testament, that was actually one of the points of the entire Old Testament, that their pagan gods were way, way, way out there, but Yahweh came here. Yahweh came and visited Moses. Yahweh came and visited Abraham. Yahweh is not way, way, way out there. God is not way, way out there that we have to get to him. He comes here. And so when you see this story of the father, he's the one who's throwing the seed out. And he's the one who's bringing a little bit of heaven right here, and he's working right now. Now, this is important because Jesus goes on to say that that is the word of God. You have been hearing me say this for month after month after month, and this is a key to understanding the parables, and this is a key to understanding uh, the, the Bible, that Jesus is the word of God. What this is saying is that God is the seed, and the seed is the word of God. And so at the birth of Jesus, the incarnation, the Father sent his Son out into the world. That is the entire world that the incarnation infected. That is the entire world that, that, that Jesus, the word of God, has been out. And so what this is, the, the, the thing behind the thing he's saying here is that my Son, I sent my Son, and my Son is the message. My Son is the message. And so we are to be, be, be proclaiming the message of Jesus, the incarnation. And that message that he sent is that, it, again, this isn't just words. This is a human who is the message. And if you're watching, again, I'm not introducing you to a religion. I'm not introducing you to a creed. I'm introducing you to a person because the person is the message that we give. And so what's the message? 
This message, that seed that's sent, and that seed that is sprouting, is the message that the Son has come in human form, and he has defeated death and hell. And that is important, because what that message says is we should have no more fear of death. That is what the whole thing is. A seed sprouts up and it gives life. It resurrects. It's giving brand new life. It's not bringing death. And so we see even right now that, that this message that we are to be giving is not a message uh, of judgment. It's not a message of fear. It is a message of life because that is the good news. That is the gospel. Listen to what Hebrews 2 says. It says, Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death. That is the devil, and right here it says, and might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. That is the message. That is the word of God, that death has been defeated. Death and Hades have been conquered. That is the hope of the resurrection. That is how life sprouts. Life does not sprout with a message of shame. Life does not sprout with a message of guilt. Life does not sprout with a message of judgment. Life sprouts with the good news of the hope of the resurrection. Again, you're, you're watching this play out in our world right now. You are watching people be terrified of death. You are watching everyone be afraid of death. And so what is our response? What is our message that we're giving? Are we planting a seed saying God is coming to judge you? Are we planting a seed that says there's murder hornets coming to take you out? Is that the seed we're planting? Because that's not the parable that Jesus has given us right now. Jesus is the word of God and he is the message of God. And we are to be giving the message that God sent his son who has defeated death and hell and even the murder hornets. That's a great band name, by the way, Murder Hornets. Write it down, Murder Hornets. But is that really the message we should be given right now? No. That's not watering the seed whatsoever. We are to be giving the message of faith. We are to be giving the message of the good news. And that is the message that I am giving you right now. Jesus is the word of God. He came in the flesh. He died and defeated death and hell. Be afraid of death no more. Because everyone is afraid of and it cripples us. Hebrews said it holds us in slavery. And so what I'm actually believing as I'm, as I'm, I'm watching all this play out, as I'm watching, and, and may I say, I'm watching a lot of Christians prove that you don't actually believe in the resurrection because you're living in fear. And it says that if you actually are following Jesus and you are actually believing in this good news, you will have no more fear of death. Notice in that Jesus goes on to explain it where he says, and they won't believe it and be saved. Again, belief in this is incredibly important. Notice he didn't say they won't believe it uh, or they won't do something and not be saved. He says they won't believe it and be saved. What do you do to be saved? You believe it and then you rest. You believe it and you rest. Think about this whole parable that he's talking about. It's just soil. It's just the soil. That's us. That's the soil of our hearts. And what does soil do? To have the seed sprout? Nothing. The seed does all the work. And so we are just to receive this with a good heart. We are to receive this and believe. And it's not about like doing all these things. It's just receiving the good news of what he's already done. And so if we don't believe this, what it produces is fear. It produces denial of God's goodness. And it produces judgment. And all these things are Satan's Lies. That's how the, Satan comes in and snatches it out. He snatches it out with fear. He snatches it out with doubt. And so if Jesus has given us a clue right here. He's just saying, like, look, my father is planting the seed. I have come. You just sit and you believe it. I don't know if you guys have been watching Netflix. Chances are you have been. But there's one great movie on there called Waco. And it's all about the Branch Davidians, um, you know, down in, down in Texas and how... This guy started this huge cult, and um, the amazing part of that movie that, that just shocked me is, one, it was a fascinating movie because it showed the failures of the government, but also uh, the people in that cult. But there were some very intelligent people who got sucked in by this cult. I mean, there was professors from Harvard. There's theologians who got caught up in this. And why'd they get caught up with this? Because uh, David Koresh produced this element of fear and then he had all these answers. 
if he was around today and if, if Facebook was around back then, he would have been blasting verses about Revelation. Totally out of context. But he, he sucked these people in because facts are not the answer. Doing these things is not the answer. That is not how you grow. That is not how life sprouts. You just receive the seed. You just receive the word of God. You receive Jesus. And then you rest and let it grow. Next, it says that there's some people who are going to receive this with joy, and then they fall away. What, how would I see this? The thing behind the thing here is this was an emotion-based decision. This was an emotion-based thing. And so there was no like real depth there, and, and, and there, it wasn't really about having a relationship with, with, with God. It was just this emotional-based thing. And, and may I say again, a lot of times, it's just kind of a get-out-of-hell-free card. And that is, that is messing up a lot of our following Jesus, that these are people who had instantly received it with joy, and then all these things came, and they choked it out, and all kinds of stuff. And it, it's kind of exposing what their uh, following Jesus always was. Again, may I say that I really believe that, that COVID right now is exposing the roots of our belief, how deep our roots actually go. So is this COVID experience, is it causing you to grow closer to Jesus is it causing you to have more faith in Jesus? Is it causing you to want to share this message more? Or is it causing more fear in you? Is it causing more depression in you? See, this is, this is why these seasons, and when he says it's like their roots didn't go down, this is showing how deep your roots are. It's showing why you're following Jesus in the first place. Again, maybe just kind of throw this aside too, just throw this out here that I think sometimes if your reason for coming to church is to uh, find friends, I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but that is not where you grow your roots. You grow your roots in Jesus. If it's coming to hear a message from a pastor that, that you agree with or whatever it is, that pastor is going to say something that you don't agree with. Where are your roots? Where are your roots at? Again, if you have no peace in this season, peace is a root that Jesus gives us. It's, it's, it's something that grows out of Christ. It's time to see if something's off, if something's wrong in your pursuit of Jesus. It's to, to show if, if you have given into this mindset of having to do and do and do and do and do, and it's not actually producing the peace that Jesus offers. Again, notice it says that um, the, this seed is, is planting on this planet. And this is why I keep saying that we're always so ready just to get out of here. But if that's why we've received Jesus, just to get out of hell free card, then we are missing that he's planting the seed right here on this planet to change this planet. That's what the kingdom of God is all about. That is why he's planting this seed so this seed can start redeeming planet Earth, not just get people into heaven. So this is a huge test for us to see where our roots actually are. And then he goes on, he says that they will never reach maturity. You know why? He's talking about the pleasures of life. He's, he's talking about, you know, money, finances, all kinds of things. And he says that is a way that you don't reach the maturity and the growth of Christ and these things and this, this peace in your life and the mission of your life. Why? Because you're just focusing on yourself all the time, just continually focusing on yourself. And Jesus came that we could be good with God so we can start focusing on other people and, and actually have a purpose for our life. And now I don't see God sitting here wagging his finger at us that if you, you go have fun with your friends or if you go on a camping trip, I don't think that's what he's doing. But what he's saying is, is you, you will not have this life grow if that is the main mission. If the main mission is not that, yeah, I'm good with God and my mission with God is to, is to minister to my family because they're little disciples too. But if your mission is just to get stuff after stuff after stuff and business after business after business, he's saying this will expose where your roots actually are. Again, when I see this passage, I, I, it's interesting to me, like the thing behind the thing is the seed wasn't punishing itself. It's not that the seed got angry and stopped growing. It was the condition of the soil. It's the condition of our hearts. And so this, this passage is Jesus really just having us take an inward look of the position of our soil in our lives and in our hearts. And that's what COVID is doing. It has given us an opportunity to step back and just say, what's the soil of my life right now? Because again, notice it says that the response was on the inside. It wasn't some outward work that we do. It wasn't some outward thing that we do. It was just simply believing the good news of who Jesus is. 
And finally, he says, but the seed in the good soil, these are the ones who have heard the word in an honest and good heart and hold it fast and bear fruit with perseverance. Again, right now, some of you are like, man, I don't have this peace. I don't have, uh, you know, maybe I, I did receive this in an emotional way, whatever it is. And, and I know oftentimes we want to know, like, what do we do? What do I do? Do I pray more? Do I read more? Do I give more? All those things are good, but they're a byproduct of fruit. What you need to do is believe him more. You just continually believe the gospel is good. You believe that it is finished. It is done. No matter where you're at in this spectrum, it's saying that seed, it produces fruit in good soil. In the good soil, it just chills. That good soil just sits there and believes that that seed is growing, even if you can't see it right now. See, so again, may I, I just be blunt that I, I, too, I really believe that in Christianity, we have, we, and I've given into this, I've done this to people, that Christianity has added so much pressure. It's added so much pressure that we need to grow our own fruit. We need to make this, we need to crack this seed open. We need to water this thing more and more and more. And I think there's some truth to that, meaning like prayer is good, reading the scriptures is good, discipleship is good, but the Father's the one who waters it. The Father's the one who makes it grow. And what we've done in Christianity, and let me just say this, is that the way to have fruit, the way to be mature is you can't fake it. You can never grow if you're going to fake it. You need to own where you're at right now in this COVID-19. You need to own where you're at in your soul. You need to own where you're at in your marriage. And, and you need to be able to confess these things. That's what confession is. Confession is a beautiful thing because it's meant to free you. And when you confess and when you admit where you're at, that's how Jesus can cultivate that ground. And that's how little weeds can get pulled out around it. That's all we need to do is just say, is just confess where we're at with Jesus. You see, in the church, we, we've been so, we've given into the world and we're so consumed by image. We're so consumed by how we look because there is shame in the church. And so what happens is we never confess these things. We're never vulnerable. We never till up the soil so that seed can begin to grow. So the way to grow is first by just letting go and just being honest. And that's what I see the thing behind the thing in this whole parable is you're the soil, you just chill, you receive his word with goodness, and then you just let the seed grow. And notice it says with perseverance. That means it's through time. But it doesn't mean the seed's not growing when you go through some hard times. It doesn't mean when the sun's out too long that that seed doesn't stop growing. Every season, this seed is going to grow. And so we just need to sit and believe the good news of what Jesus told us. Jesus gave us the answer in how to grow in John 15. He said, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So that was the key. He was saying, abide in me. You just sit. You're the soil. You just sit and know that he is working and you have faith even when you can't see it. But he is growing this in your life. Again, I promise this is the last time I'm going to talk about the Jordan documentary because it's over and it's done, but it was amazing. You should watch it. The last one, I may or may not have cried. I don't know. But there's this one thing that they said about Michael Jordan that separated him from everybody else. They said he was amazing at living in the present. He never thought about the past. He never got worked up about last season or a last game. He had this amazing ability to live in the present, which helped him flourish and grow and thrive in a present situation. And they asked him once about that. And he says, why would I worry about missing a shot that I haven't even taken yet? See, that's what Jesus is talking about, that it, it, it's, it's, all of us have failures. All of us have dried up days. All of us have failed to water the, the seed. But he says, look, if you abide in me right here, right now, in this moment, and believe in me, it will grow. And it is growing. Yes, we water the soil with our prayers. We water the soil with our confession. We water the soil with our worship. But he's telling us right now, all you need to do is just expose this to the sun. 
And may I use a play on words that we just expose all the things we're going through, all the things in our life, putting the past things behind us, and we just sit out in the Son of God, and we let Him just grow this and grow this and grow this. The cool part about this is, this is a reason that Jesus starts His parable out this way, and here's one of the things behind the things. You think you have to water it. Well, Jesus said, I'm the water of life, so you just abide in Him. And you might say, well, I need to give it light. He's like, well, no, I'm actually the light of life, too. So this is all about taking the pressure off of your own growth, and it's just abiding in Jesus and letting him cultivate the soil, him uh, you know, you know, having new things grow in your life. Again, also look for things that are positive, meaning often so many times you might be discouraged, you might see failures in your life, you might see things that just suck that you're doing. One way to look um, at your growth is look at the fruit that's already come. So often we're looking at the branch in our life that, that uh, has no buds on it, has nothing on there, and we miss the one that is already blooming. We saw this, this uh, you know, right now in spring, I love it when the tulips come up, and you'll see it, like when that first one blooms, I don't look at the ones who hasn't, that haven't bloomed, I look at this beautiful flower that already has. And so that's one way to see this growth that, this, that is happening, is start looking at the things that Jesus has done, start looking at the things that God has changed in you instead of always looking at the next thing that he has to grow in you. See, I'm just going to be honest with, with where I'm at, um, because again, as I'm, I'm getting older and I'm mature, and I'm just seeing how God does this, that you just, you just sit back and, and you read his word and you pray, and all those things are good, but not in pressure. I don't do it if I feel like I have to do it. There's times at night, like, you know, where I sit on the porch and I read the Word, I read the Bible, and I pray, and it's great. You know what there's other times I do? I sit and I play video games with my son, and it's awesome. I don't feel any pressure because I know Jesus is there with me in that moment with my son. And he's with me outside when I'm playing basketball with my kids. It's not about saying, like, I have to do this and I have to do this. All those things are good, but the point is, is just know that he is growing you. And so now here's what I do. I actually, uh, I'm done asking Jesus to change me. I know he is changing me. I confess the things in my life. I confess the things that I know are wrong. And I say, you are going to finish the job. I follow him knowing he is growing me. He is maturing me. He is bringing new fruit in my life. And the beautiful thing about that is even in the hard seasons, I don't ask, Lord, please change this. I say, Lord, thank you for the fruit and the things that you're growing in my heart and my life right now through this season. Even in failure, I'm like, Lord, I know that you still love me. I know that I'm still, uh, you know, adopted child of God. Please show me where the growth is happening, even in this situation. That's the way that we grow. We sit we cultivate the soil, and we believe that God is growing us. Let me show you even a deeper thing behind the thing. You see, some of you live in failure. Some of you live in shame. Some of you live in your past, and you don't think that you're growing. And we miss a, a secret mystery behind this. It says the first one, it says the birds came and ate the seed up, meaning Jesus goes on to explain that that was Satan, that Satan came and tried to stop the word of God in someone's heart. This is how amazing God is, that it never stops his, his plan. It never stops his growth. What do birds do? Birds eat a seed, and then they poop it out somewhere else. And when they poop it out, it, it lands, and it fertilizes the ground, and it grows somewhere else. So even Satan can't stop God's growth in your life. And again, everyone's talking about murder hornets. Yeah, don't want to get involved with those. But guess what hornets do? They land, they sting you sometimes, but they land on flowers and they take that pollen and they take it somewhere else and it starts growing somewhere else. There is nothing that can stop this. There's nothing that can stop the gospel. There's nothing that can stop the kingdom of God being grown. All we need to do is have the right soil for our hearts to allow God to, uh, to, to grow it inside of us. He goes on to say this in Luke 8. No one, after lighting a lamp, covers it over with a container or puts it under a bed, but he puts it on a lampstand so that those who come in may see the light. For nothing is hidden that will not become evident, nor anything secret that will not be made known. So take care, or take care how you listen, for whoever has, to him more shall be given, and whoever does not have, even what he thinks he has, shall be taken away from him." I've always heard people use this as they're calling somebody else out on their sin. 
I've always heard people use this when they say, oh, see, like, nothing's going to, it's all going to be exposed. Everything you have done is going to be exposed. That has nothing to do with what Jesus is talking about here. What he is saying is that if you have the right soil in your heart, not about your moral behavior, not about your past, not about your sin, not about how much you know about God. It says if you just have an open heart, that seed will sprout and nothing will be hidden from you. He wants to tell you things, not just the preacher boy right here. He wants to tell you things and nothing will be hidden. It will just keep coming. It'll keep coming. It'll be coming. He'll give you more revelation and more revelation and more revelation and it will produce this beautiful, mature fruit in your life. But then he says, you don't hide anything. And here's what I think was going on here. I think Jesus knew that he was talking to a bunch of Jews who thought they were the chosen ones. And now he just gives a parable that says, the Father's for everyone. And the kingdom of God is gonna go throughout the world. And he knew that they were gonna come against him for that. And he says, look, what he's saying is, I don't care. I know you're gonna crucify me. I know you're gonna come against me. And what I have found is this message of inclusion even ticks off a lot of Christians. But he says, it doesn't matter. You have to let this light shine. You have to let these things be said. And so as God reveals these things to you, it is not just for you. One way that you show that you are mature is you share these things with other people. Notice it never says the crop fails. The kingdom of God will never fail. The crop will never fail. It says some seeds fail. But it says that he keeps scattering and scattering and scattering. Here's another thing behind the thing. I actually believe that this is a picture of discipleship of everyone. That I have been at every single spot in this passage. I've heard the message and it just kind of went away. And then I've received the message of joy and I got all excited about it and now I got this new life and then the pressures of the world take me back. And then I've moved on to the next level where I finally do receive it, but then man, I gotta feed my family and I gotta have this and I gotta do that. And then it slowly starts choking out that word of life. And then I've been at this next level where I just said, okay, I'm in, I'm ready to go. Do whatever you gotta do. And you see growth after growth, after growth, after growth. God, Father God is always casting seed and he is not gonna cast you aside. So no matter where you are at in this, you will be in all these different stages. And so you need to see what stage you're at in right now and just believe that the Father is gonna grow this into maturity in your life. And you just sit back and receive the good news of Jesus. And so Jesus said, we should not be hiding this light. We should not be hiding this message. And the message is the good news that Jesus came, he died, and he rose again for humanity. So Christians, let me just be blunt as I'm looking at this corona season right now. I believe that we can uproot, we can uproot seeds that Jesus has planted in other people. I believe that we can tear that seed out because we think it should be something else or we think it should be a different kind of fruit in people. And we judge them by their morality. We judge them by what they're doing. We judge people by what their politics are. We judge people by what lifestyle they have. And we can uproot something that Jesus is doing with our shame and our judgment and our fear. But this passage is telling us that we have to believe that he is working. The religious ones missed it the ones who had all the right views of the end times, the ones who had all the right views of morality, the ones who had all the right doctrine, they were the ones who missed it. And Jesus looked at them and says, you are evangelizing the world and you're making those people more fit for hell. They were the ones who missed it. But you know who didn't miss it? It was the ones where you wouldn't even think God was working in their life. You wouldn't even, because they had all this messed up you know, exterior. It was the prostitutes, it was the tax collectors, it was the government officials, it was the drunks, it was them who came to Jesus because they had nowhere else to go. And so that's, those are the ones that, we, that sometimes we look at people and we say, man, I mean, you might see him on TV, you might see some politician that you think is so messed up and you have no idea that God is working in their soul and it is taking one person to come and water it with encouragement because shame uproots certain seeds but, but encouragement of the good news waters something that God is doing. I don't, want to, I don't want to be that believer. 
I don't want to be, I, I let God do the judging. I want to be the water. I want to be the one who just believes that he's working in every one of my neighbors, that, he, that he's working at every person that I run into, that that is what the Father is doing, is he's casting that seed into the world, and I just want to water it. So may I say this, I am begging you, if you are a, a, a person who follows Zootown Church, I am begging you to stop spreading fear online. I am begging you to stop posting things on social media that you have no idea if it's true or not. I am begging you to stop quoting the book of Revelation right now because even when I read some of this stuff, and, and, and let's say the, the evangelical view of Revelation is true, there's so many things that would have to happen for some of those things to come true. I'm watching people quote Revelation 13, and I'm like, we haven't even gotten through some of the other ones. Everyone, this is our job. Our job is to preach the good news of Jesus that is the message in this parable, that he is scattering seed, and it's the good news of God, and we are to water that seed in people's hearts. So please own where you're at. If you are afraid, own it and confess it so you can start having new fruit be produced. But stop posting this stuff because it's not doing anything. It's not causing seeds to grow. Right now, the world needs hope. The world does not need more fear. And we can be uprooting some people's faith right now by this fear message. The world needs the gospel of the good news of Jesus Christ, that he came, he died, he rose from the dead, and he is bringing good fruit into people's life. Jesus said, let your light shine before men that you may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. And so it's time we refocus and we, we see some fruit through this season that we start seeing that what God is already working in people, and we just keep watering it. We just keep watering it. We just keep watering it. And may I say again, if you are not a follower of Christ, I don't care where you're at. It says he throws a seed right now. I don't care what you've done. I don't care what you believe. I don't care how much you know. Receive the good news of Jesus Christ in your life today, that he has defeated death and hell and that you have no more fear of death in Jesus Christ because Jesus took the scariest thing, our death, but in the resurrection, he turned it into the beginning of new life. And so receive the good news of the word that has already started inside. Notice it's in your heart. Christ is living in everybody because he is life and he's speaking to everyone and he's in their hearts and we just have to cultivate the soil to let that, that, that good news and that fruit continue to grow and grow and grow. And it's a lifetime of growth as we are becoming like Christ. And so let me just end with this again. This message is so important. There have been 75,000 suicides since this went down because of fear, because of depression, because the world needs the good news right now. And the Father is scattering the good news everywhere. And we are ones to water it. And so here, let me just give you a key as we walk through the rest of these parables. Here's the actual thing behind the thing. If you want to understand the parables and you want to get these parables right, you have to see that Jesus saw everything through his birth, the cross, and the resurrection. That is the thing behind the thing. He is the seed. He is the seed. And a seed has to die. A seed splits open and dies. But what comes out of that death is new life and the resurrection. And so as we move forward in this series, just know, in order to understand the key to every parable, you have to view it through the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I give you this good news today, and I believe God is working in you. I believe he's going to finish the job in you. And I believe if you would just focus on some of those flowers that are blooming, you won't look at the ones that haven't taken fruition yet. And I bless you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.